Welcome, Brandon. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks for having me. So your latest novel, The Removed, is a beautiful story, so well-written, about all different characters as they relate to the loss of a 15-year-old boy. Ray Ray, tell me a little more about what inspired you to write this novel. Where did it come from? Well, it came out of a question. Um, You know, Chekhov says that um, fiction should begin with questions. And so the question um, is always what I um, begin with um, in, in my work. And the big question here was how do we, how do we grieve and how do we heal? Um, but I'm, al- I'm also really interested in the question of uh, what is home. And, and I think that um, applies to this book, um, as well as some of my other, my other work, but, but th- those are really the, you know, that's the, the sort of starting place for me or examining those questions and, and then sort of, um, taking it from there. Well, I feel like you tapped into so many different things. It's like, if somebody had an issue going on, it's probably in this book and, and someone with Alzheimer's, someone with an opioid addiction, someone with loss, someone you know, like all of these things are so relevant to everyone. And yet somehow you even weave them in and, you know, threw in a, f- a foster care child to boot. Do you know what I mean? Like there's every, you packed so much in and yet it all sort of interwove seamlessly by how you divided the different points of view into the different chapters. Um, what made you want to, how did you decide to sort of take this view by all the different people in the family and sort of shifting the, the camera lens, if you will, like around to different places and perspectives? Well, for one thing I like, one of the things I like about um, fiction writing is getting inside characters' heads. And, and so here was an opportunity to, to, to take the, uh, the Achota family um, and get inside their heads and, and, um, you know, the, the different points of view are, are all first person. Um, so that means, you know, trying to, um, have very distinct voices. Um, I don't know, you know, whether I, I pulled that off as well as I could have, I don't know, but I, you know, that, that's part of the, the fun. It's sort of like acting. Um, and, and I think I, I heard Otessa Moshveg um, say this a few years ago. We, I went to her reading and, and then afterwards um, we went out to, to dinner and talked a little bit. But one of the things that she said, and I think it's certainly true of, of me, is that it's sort of like acting in that, um, you know, you're, you're, you're getting inside a character and really seeing how they respond to certain situations. And, and um, you know, that, that's a big part of the pleasure of writing um is um is doing that and playing with voice and um circumstance and so you know that this family i had the mother maria um which you know she was maybe the most challenging because she's an older woman who's lost a child and and I, i i didn't you know i wanted to try to get that that voice somewhat distinct and specific. So I actually talked to um, a friend of my mom's and my mom's in her seventies and um, a friend of hers who many years ago had lost her teenage son. And so I, you know, talked to her a little bit about that experience, which was hard, but, um, but it needed to be done, you know, so. That's true. I should have added this to the many themes that you touched on in the book, which is also like police brutality in a way, or um, really racism and targeting people on first glance based on how they look, um, which is what happened with Ray Ray in the, in the story. I mean, so many powerful, powerful issues um, to be explored, really. Um, it's really amazing. So when you sit down to write this book and, okay, fine, we have Chekhov's question, right? This is the question you're doing. How did you decide how to craft all of these characters and have and what you were going to tackle in their passages? Like, what did you 
did you did you start it off and do I mean obviously you did research by talking to your mom's friend did you research all the characters did you outline the whole thing did you did they just appear in your head um yeah I you know that's that's a very difficult question it's you know where do characters sort of come from and and I you know I don't I don't necessarily outline um but I start more with an image so sometimes images will come you know that I'll I'll see and I'm not sure where what the scene is or when it takes place but I'll see a character doing something right you know and you know um that I think for Edgar's Edgar's part, which is probably the strangest of all of them, because he does have some addiction problems. And, you know, it, it, I wanted those sections to be the most surreal, you know, the most strange, not only because of um, not only because of his drug use, but also because he finds himself in this sort of mythical place called the Darkening Land, which is taken out of the Darkening Land is out of um, old Cherokee stories. Um, that's a specific place. But in this place, I kind of had free reign to create it however I wanted to. And I really wanted to hone in on the strangeness of this place and and kind of hopefully parallel it to the strangeness of the country we're living in right now in terms of look at the way that racism is, you know, is, is so prevalent today. And um, the way that video games are used um, and virtual reality and, uh, you know, that Edgar, Edgar becomes a target of a game that he fears for his life, you know, a shooting game, a real shooting game that he becomes. And but I was able to to, you know, that was that was really exciting because that was, again, crafting out of a kind of an alternate universe, you know, a very dreamlike, surreal place. Um, so those, his sections were really fun. Um, I knew that, um, I knew that so I wanted Sonia um, to be very obsessive and, um, um, you know, obsessed with romantic, uh, you know, the, the sort of, she, she's she's a very strong woman and and she's very confident but she finds herself involved with um a guy who is is not native who becomes very dangerous right and i i knew that i wanted sonia's character to be in a situation with someone who is dangerous again so she's placed in danger edgar's placed in danger in the darkening land um and you know, the mother Maria is really um, the one that, um, you know, is trying to, to pull everything together, right? She's, she's dealing with her husband's Alzheimer's and, you know, her husband Ernest is just really, um, you know, suffering from, from his Alzheimer's. But, but then they take in this uh, wonderful little boy named Wyatt who almost feels like, he begins to heal Ernest because of look at how closely he resembles Ray Ray from 15, 20 years ago. Right. And that, that's, you know, that I, I it, it was just sort of at the beginning, it just was taking off, you know, and I was, I was doing each character separately. I was writing and here's the way I, I knew that, you know, I was writing Sonia's, um, her thread and I was writing Edgar's thread and I knew, you know, with, with Maria and Ernest, um, you know, their threads just sort of just started taking off. And I think that's often what happens when you start writing and you really get to know your, your characters very intimately, very well. They, they sort of start doing things on their own and you just kind of follow along. So I don't really, um, I don't really outline much. All that sort of stuff comes with with editing afterwards is to help help with the structure and shape um, after the draft that I think the most fun part is the very first draft because you're just, you know, Charles Johnson um, said that uh, if you Charles Johnson, he wrote this fantastic craft book. He was a student of uh, 
um, uh, John Gardner's, but um, Charles Johnson in his craft book talked about the pleasure, you know, the fun of writing and that craft that finding that pleasure really is where I feel I, for me, it's, um, I feel very strongly about that and its importance to my work. How many times do you think you started novels at this point? Like, have there been others that you've started that haven't been finished? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, my twenties, um, in my, you know, back in the nineties, um, I, uh, I started, yeah, I would, I would, I, I had several novels that it, it, I don't know. It took me a really long time. I've been writing for, you know, since I started college for, you know, 30 years. And so, um, I mean, at some point, I, I wasn't writing as a as a as a kid, um, you know. Fi- but I started writing fiction in college, and so it's been a long time. It, it, I just, you know, it's taken a long time to develop. I think an understanding of of how to do it, right? Well, anything else? I mean, writing novels takes so long relative to like a round of tennis. You know, I mean, like mm. if you if you only played five rounds of tennis, you wouldn't be that good. But people, you know, especially your first round, right? But people, yeah. when they when they, because novels take so long, sometimes, right? Then they think, well, because of all the amount of work and time invested, it should speed up or something. But it doesn't. Um, oh. You still need the practice. Somebody, another author I was talking to said, well, it took me, you know, twenty eight novels to get to number one on the bestseller list. I'm like, well. That makes sense to me. Like it's, that makes sense to me, right? If you do something over and over, over and get better and better at it, then yeah, it stands to reason. You might have your most success at your 28th book versus your first, not to say that there aren't, you know, anyway. Well, there are, yeah, there are great, amazing young writers, you know, and that's, that's, that just is amazing to me. You know, when you have someone in their, in their twenties, which is really young, I think to, um, to be so good. Um, but you know, they're out there and I think that's great. Um, you know, but, uh, it, it, it is a lot of work. I don't have a whole lot of other hobbies really. I mean, I don't, you know, um, I mean, I have two kids here and so my hobbies are usually spending time with them and shooting, shooting baskets, you know, with, with my 13 year old, um, you know, and, and, uh, or, or my seven-year-old, you know. Um, so uh, th- there's an obsession about it, I think. And that's that's probably true of anything. Like you say, tennis. I think one has to have an, an obsession, right, in order to, to really, it seems like to me, I don't know, there, there's probably a lot of natural ability in sports, um, you know, but um, I don't know if that's true with writing this natural ability, right? I mean, um, I think, I think people have natural, I think there, if people have natural ability, but I think that some people who don't can get really great at it. And I think some people who do can squander it. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I don't know. How do you, how do you find, I have, um, I have two 13 year olds and a seven year old, and I also have a six year old. And I find that that makes my ability to ever write or <laughs> be productive a little bit impaired. How has that been for you, especially with the pandemic and how has that affected your writing to be, you know, parenting? Well, um, anything else? Yeah, it's really strange because um, my 13, well, yeah, as you know, you know, they're pretty self-sufficient and they can kind of do, you know, he, he, he can do stuff on it like the math. I, you know, my wife has to, help him. I don't remember seventh grade math being that difficult, you know, but, <laughs> but um, I, my, I like uh, helping my seven year old, um, you know, he does, especially with the art projects, like, I, you know, we went out and found leaves, which, I mean, I live in the desert, there aren't a, a lot of leaves out, but we went over to a tree and found some leaves um, a few months ago, and we're able to make birds and, you know, for, so I, I mean, those, those have been fun. I, my writing, because especially during the pandemic, um, I haven't been able to write during the day. Um, so it's been between the hours of 10 PM and two or 3 AM usually. Um, and, and during those, 
you know, four hours that I sit down to really think, okay, this is my, my writing time and I'll get as much, I'll try to get as much done as I can. Um, and I find it, I, I tell myself it's a, it's a success, even if I just go through and edit, you know, or, or write half a page or a page. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a success because, you know, you can go days and days without, without writing. Um, but I'm, I always try to, I'm always during the day, I'm always trying to, to think about it. Right. But I, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a night owl anyway. Um, so um, I, I, I will sleep, you know, a little bit later and um, stay up late. Right. But I've always been like that. Interesting. Um, yeah. Did you feel like after your book got nominated for the national book award that you had like anxiety about starting another book? Like, do you, did you, or did that fuel your resolve to sort of write something else amazing? I don't know that it really gave me anxiety. Um, I mean, there's so much out there, you know, there's so many books. I, you know, I, part of, I think this is part of, for me was I, you know, I published a couple of books with, with small presses you know, and I'm used to really not people not paying that much attention. I think that I don't know. It just sort of, I don't think so much about it when I work. I think had that been a debut novel, like the first thing I ever published, it, it might've created some more anxiety. Um, you know, mo- most of, I guess most of my anxiety and I do, um, I, I do have, anxiety comes more along the lines of when I'm having to be in a social situation with people, you know, and talk about it. I mean, with you, this, you know, one-on-one and I'm, I'm at, I'm at my house. So, you know, it's, um, it's, but, you know, going and talking about the book in in front of large groups of people is, you know, gives me um, significant anxiety. And, and, and then I find myself, you know, having one too many, uh, glasses of wine or, or, or too many beers, or something, you know, to, <laughs> to try to overcompensate, you know, and then I may embarrass myself, but, um, I don't know. It's gotten better. Um, so well, I feel bad even, I, I mean, I, I said the thing about anxiety cause I was literally just like putting myself in your shoes and like, I worry about everything all the time. So then as I was saying the question, I was like, okay, this is my own issue that I am now asking. (laughs) So it just happened that you also like have that same thing. So anyway, um, no, I, you know, I, I, I do, I have, um, yeah, I, I do. I have severe anxiety. My, when I was a kid, I had such social anxiety so bad. It was, it was, Beyond, I did, you know, I, I just wouldn't talk for long periods of time. But it's um, it's gotten <laughs> it's gotten way better now. But uh, um, yeah, I uh, I've talked to you know I didn't talk to a therapist my whole life, so that helps, you know. Um, so yeah, I actually um, I had a lot of social anxiety as a kid as well, and I went this one entire summer on like a summer program to France where I just uh, like didn't talk. I was supposed to go learn the language and live with the family. And I spoke a little in French, which now, of course, I don't remember a word of. But with my peers, I was so shy. I did. I like didn't open my mouth the whole summer. But what I found during that time, which I think of a lot, and I don't know if you do the same thing, is I spent so much time analyzing language because it seemed so natural for other people to just talk right (laughs) and I was so struggling with the ability just to talk and like figure out what would come next and it and I just listened all summer and I don't know I think about that sometimes now as I ramble or you know write my heart out or whatever um how at times it's so hard to even form a sentence and how that ease of conversation I don't know it's sort of stayed with me yeah I you know, I, I went to Paris for the first time the summer before last, and I I taught um, for a week long writing workshop, um, and and that that was the best, most amazing trip I've ever 
um, I've ever been on. It was so great that, I mean, I, I love the language. I, I love the, the, the city. Um, I loved everything about it. I'd never been out of the country. I'd been to Mexico once in my entire life. That's, you know, I'd never been anywhere else. Um, and so it was, uh, yeah, it was um, my I didn't I didn't feel like I had any kind of I walked around a lot, you know, and, and just it was just amazing. an amazing, amazing experience. So, yeah. So interesting. Um, well, are you working on anything else now? Like, what is it you're doing in the middle of the night? Yeah. So I, I am. I, there are a couple of things um, I'm working on. Um one is it's it, it's too early to really know what it's going to sort of form into yet you know it's um but but i have you know i'm um i'm working through i'm, I'm going through this first draft and you know and it's it's not much yet you know it's it's not much at all but um and then i'm i'm working also on kind of a children's book so um not not as in real young but as in you know um middle grade right like my son's a seventh grader and and so I've started that um and hope that that um I I you know I just like to do different stuff you know I'm um in terms of writing Stuff is a weird word, I know, but I mean, you know, I, different, I always like a different project. So we'll see. Yeah, got to keep mixing it up. <laughs> yeah, there's always something I'm working on, always. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Well, what advice would you have to be, to um, aspiring authors? Well, you know, I, I think that, the, one of the most important things is just, you know, this is what everybody says, but to read a lot and read widely with a very open mind. Right. And then, um, you know, I, I think writing, the more you do it, it it's almost like the more you do it, the more fun it becomes. Um, and, I, you know, if if aspiring writers are not in a program, you know, or have taken a workshop or a class, now that sometimes those get really bad. I don't have an MFA, you know. I, I didn't go for an MFA. I, I haven't. I have an MA in English, but then I and then I went on and got a PhD. But there's something to be said about, you know, a com- a community being around a community of other writers and people who are in the same space with you and you're all you know looking at each other's work and helping each other there's there's really a lot um there was a time in my life where i i didn't have that at all and so um i'm you know when i did i I became very grateful and i think that that was largely what helped me become a better writer on a on a level on a you know on a craft level is you know, having that community of people. So I would just say, you know, other than reading widely, just, you know, get your work in among, among um, a community of readers, you know, that you can just share each other's work and, and talk about, um, you know, uh, what's working and what's not working. So, yeah. That's great advice. I feel like, especially now with the whole world on, on Zoom and sort of, your, your local habitat sort of opening up to everybody else, it's easier to find those like-minded souls than it was yeah. before when you were sort of confined by the people around you, right? Who, might, yeah. who may or may not share your interests at all. Um, but now, um, you know, you're in the desert somewhere talking about writing. I'm in New York City. You, it's just like, I don't know, it's so neat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One thing I... I um... I, I didn't talk about in the, in terms of the new book was um, there's an ancestral voice um, th- named Chala. Um, and, and one thing I did want to mention um, if it's okay, of course. was that, was that Chala 
um, in, in the book is based on a real man um, named Cha Lee. And so what, uh, what happened was um, he was, was killed for refusing to, to leave the land, right? When um, Andrew Jackson ordered removal and, you know, um, soldier bef- before the migration, what, what ended up being the trail of what's known as tra- the trail of tears. Um, some people refused to go. And, and there was one man who um, with his son died. Um, and so this Chala, this, this ancestral voice is based on him. And he's speaking to the, to the Achota family in the book. Um, all, uh, you know, trying to weave in, here's again, that, that question of how do we grieve? And, and how do we, how do we heal? Right. And so um, he, he, he incorporates some, um, you know, the uh, traditional Cherokee stories, uh, but it was also fun because I um, also had a couple of, of my own that I just sort of, right. Um, was one of yours, the, who had the one about the deer, the doe talking to the guy who had to in the woods and he had to run and then he like stood where the, I'm not explaining this well. And then the leeches would get him. And um, well, yeah, the leeches that's based on a, that's, that's based off a traditional story, but um, you know, the, uh, the him rescuing the wolf and the wolf speaking through his eyes. Um, you know, that, that's, that was, that was me. That's not necessarily from a traditional story. So, but I guess, you know, um, that to, to return to the pleasure of, of writing, to go back to the aspiring for aspiring writers, you know, it, it should, I really think there should be a lot of enjoyment, a lot of pleasure. Right. I, I like the sort of strangeness of it. I think it's Coleridge, right. Who said great art should uh, incorporate some type of strangeness. <laughs> I, I don't, you know, that was Coleridge who said that. So I don't know, you know, um, take what you will, but um, I, I do, I do feel very strongly about the pleasure of, of, um, of writing. And if it starts to feel like it's not pleasurable and it's just work, um, then it's, it's maybe time to just put it aside and, and start something else, you know? Excellent. Excellent yeah. advice. Well, this is great. We started with Chekhov. We ended with Coleridge. This is fantastic. I feel like I yeah. just had like a little, little English throwback class here today. So <laughs> yeah. thank you for uh, dusting yeah. off the volumes well, in my mind. <laughs> that's what, that's what I guess getting a PhD does to you. It's sort of, yeah, right. It makes yes. you throw these, these names out there, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Might as well sort of get your money's worth out of that PhD. Yeah. If not now, right. when? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, well, Brandon, thank you so much. It was really a pleasure talking to you. And I hope this wasn't, um, you know, as anxiety in- invoking for either of us as uh, perhaps some other settings. And um, it's yeah, been a thank pleasure you. to talk one-on-one with you here today. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. It was fun. Good. <laughs> okay. okay. Have a great day. Okay. okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.